The museum was given over to Indian arts and manufacture, and anybody who sought wisdom could ask the curator to explain. There were hundreds of pieces, friezes of figures in relief, fragments of statues, and slabs crowded with figures that had encrusted the brick walls of the Buddhist stupas and the viharas of the North Country, and now dug up and labelled made the pride of the museum. It was this wondrous assembly of ancient artefacts that greeted Kim, the orphaned protagonist of Rudyard Kipling's most celebrated and eponymous novel, as he escorted the aged Tibetan Lama inside the Lahore Museum, or the Wonder House, as the citizens of Lahore call it, to meet the wise, white-bearded English curator, the keeper of images, to pray before the gods there. The Lahore Museum stands in the now Pakistani city to this day, one of the grandly imposing structures built in Lahore during the British period of colonial rule. The 21st Century Museum is home to the country's largest and oldest collection of historical, cultural and artistic objects, including an internationally celebrated collection of Buddhist antiquities from the Gandhara, now Peshawar region of Pakistan, so admired by Kipling's Lama. As we walk through the Victorian Albert Museum's own galleries, containing the rich collections from South and Southeast Asia, there is a similarly eclectic, astounding array of objects. Indian textiles and sculpture, mogul jades and rock crystal, jewellery, ceramics, glass and lacquerware from across the subcontinent. Here, in the South Kensington Wonder House, or what Prince Albert called a great treasure or storehouse of science and art, visitors marvel at these beautiful designs in equal open-mouthed wonder. Many of these objects have complex and increasingly contested histories. The origins of the v lie partly with the East India Company repository, which was the location for much of the collecting, sometimes gifts, sometimes purchases, but sometimes loot or booty, which agents of British colonialism carried out in South Asia. Indeed, some of the objects here originated from that collection. These issues of provenance and cultural exchange and debates around institutional decolonization continue to gather momentum in museums around the world. And as we proceed with the vital 21st century challenge of opening up museum collections in an era of multiculturalism, identity politics, and growing interest in the colonial and imperial past, historical figures of empire, such as Rudyard Kipling and George Orwell, the imperialist and the anti-imperialist, are hooving back into contestation. Both men were born in India, both returned to the East to work after school, both were men of strong political convictions, and empire provides a unifying theme to their work. So my thesis in this Orwell lecture is how these most provocative of British writers and their complex interrelationship can provide a useful frame to interrogate this essential debate about the role and function of the modern Wonder House. We don't know how George Orwell felt about the V&A, but we know much of what he thought about Kipling. He called Rudyard Kipling the prophet of British imperialism in its expansionist phase. Famously socialist, Orwell's political beliefs were radically shaped by his service with the Indian Imperial Police in colonised Burma, and later with the POUM militia in Spain. Against imperialism, because I know something about it from the inside, he explained. For Kipling, on the other end of the political spectrum, the balladeer of the white man's burden, empire was primarily regarded as a benevolent moral force, with its internationally homogenous network of power, security and welfare. For Kipling, who spent his early years growing up in British India, then returned to work at the Civil and Military Gazette, the leading newspaper of the Punjab, aged only 16, he expressed a deep-rooted fascination and affection for his country of birth. But this was set against 
the paternalistic right of white government rule where there was no conceivable alternative to the natural course of empire. Though Orwell did not dispute Kipling's talent as a writer, he was repulsed by his world view. He, Kipling, is a jingo imperialist. He is morally insensitive and aesthetically disgusting, Orwell concluded. Or, as Edward Said later concurred, few more imperialist and reactionary than he. Memories of empire and their contemporary legacies hang over the meaning and legitimacy of so-called encyclopedic or global museums today. And there is an increasing expectation for museums to be transparent and open about the origins of their collections, particularly those acquired during controversial periods, such as British colonial history. The publication of the Savoy Saar report into collections in French museums acquired during the colonial period, demands for the restitution of items held in the British Museum, the V&A, and other national collections to countries of origin, the debate around the Humboldt Forum and anthropological collections in Germany, and just recently the statement by the Dutch museums on colonial heritage have all intensified thinking in this area. What is more, the resurgent Black Lives Matter movement has restarted a new in-depth conversation about provenance cultural exchange and decolonization of curriculum and collections. Today, the public is rightly curious about how objects were acquired and who they belong to and where they came from. If the V&A has traditionally foregrounded design history, craftsmanship, materiality, creative influence, there is now a stronger focus also on provenance and ownership. But the conversation feels fraught, caught often between a populist right determined to defend our history from the pulling down of statues, moving of museum busts, renaming of college buildings and cancelling of various unwoke Great Britons from Darwin to Churchill. And on the other hand, a cultural left just as committed to reclaiming public spaces from racist monumentalism such as Edward Colston's statue in Bristol, decolonizing the curriculum, supporting the restitution of colonial era artifacts, and prioritizing the lived experiences, emotions, and cultural traditions of underprivileged groups. As the Museum of London curator, Dr. Daniel Tom puts it, if we are actually embroiled in a cultural war, even a manufactured one, then museums are battlegrounds because they shape and reflect cultural contexts. As with Orwell and Kipling's own personal histories, this is complex territory. In the increasing absence of pluralism, this is a fiercely divided debate fought on the fringes. Too often, committed anti-racist campaigners seek to denounce all artifacts of imperial history outright, while many conservative polemicists fail to appreciate that the structures of race, which underpin the ideology of the later British Empire, still support inequality, prejudice and discrimination today in ways that cannot be ignored or wished away. Orwell too grappled with divisive identity politics in his own era. Indifference to objective truth, he once complained, is encouraged by the sealing off of one part of the world from another. Here, he referenced the division of nationalist political groups into opposing hostile units, but he could equally be talking of our own age. Orwell was an ardent defender of freedom of thought and speech. His dystopian society in the novel 1984, a stark warning to the dangers to propaganda eclipsing free speech. He also denounced the dangers of self-censorship, the risk that certain topics might be kept out of print, not because of prosecution, but because they might incite negative public opinion. If liberty means anything at all, he proclaimed, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. This famous quote is rightly inscribed next to his bronze figure outside the BBC's headquarters and is worth lingering on. Yet now even Orwell, the anti-imperialist, 
and defender of liberty, does not escape accusations of imperial complicity. For Orwell, like Kipling, was born into empire. His mother raised to a wealthy family by indigenous servants in Burma, a province of British India since the 19th century. And his father was an opium tax collector in India. He later wrote of the decadence he enjoyed as part of the Burmese ruling class. I habitually allowed myself to be dressed and undressed by my Burmese boy. At this stage, as Emma Larkin observed, he was a distinctly un-Orwellian character. With much less sense of angst, Kipling's father, John Lockwood Kipling, had also been employed in British India, installed as the curator of the Lahore Central Museum, as well as the principal of the new Mayo School of Industrial Art, today Pakistan's National College of Art and Design. Rudyard Kipling felt an extraordinary pride in his father, remembering him affectionately as a mine of knowledge and help, a humorous, tolerant an expert fellow craftsman, and above all, as a teacher of teachers. Lockwood Kipling had a profound influence on his son's work, and in his debt to his father, Kipling even immortalised his likeness in Kim's gentle, white-bearded keeper of images in the Wonder House. From the V&A's 2017 exhibition on Lockwood Kipling, curated by Julius Bryant, we've gained much valuable scholarship on the designer, writer, educator, conservationist and curator. During an 18-year tenure at the Lahore Museum from 1875 to 1893, he was resolutely focused on the institution's curatorial development and as a determined collector, one of his successes lay in the substantial growth and diversity of the collection. Lockwood Kipling's deepest interest lay in the museum's Gandahar and Greco-Buddhist sculpture, and many early 20th century photographs of these sculptures now reside in the V&A. Lahore Museum's early collection was largely derived from the Punjab exhibition of arts and industry of 1864, part of the colonial drive to assemble India's cultural artefacts and assess the subcontinent's economic potential. An integral element of empire, the early colonial museum was inherently connected to trade, with curators appointed to build up networks of native artisans and promote global sales, all to enable imperial administrations to advance their economic interests. But more than that, the Colonial Museum was also an instrument of authoritative knowledge making, as Sugata Ray writes. Quotes, not only did the museum fabricate an immense archive of useful knowledge and a fictive past for the colony, but it also served as a space through which the empire rhetorically asserted the moral necessity, the civilizing mission of its presence in the colony. Kipling's curator in his novel Kim makes this role absolutely clear. I am here to gather the knowledge, he tells the Lama, before showing him a mound of books, photographs, maps and reproductions charting the holy sites of Buddhism. Other colonial museums across India also supported these principles. For the erstwhile Victoria and Albert Museum, established in Bombay in 1872, today the Dr. Baldaj Lard Mumbai City Museum, its magnificent colonial architecture was full of bravura about the purpose of empire. This was a museum that would offer the chance for the city's merchant princes to prove their loyalty to the British crown in the aftermath of the 1857 Indian Mutiny, Rebellion or War of Resistance. In the words of the businessman Sir Jagannath Shankarseth, President of the Museum Committee, the museum would be a tribute, quote, worthy of the august and good sovereign who wielded the scepter of the mightiest and most beneficent empire the globe has ever bowed beneath. The foundation stone was laid by Sir Bartle Frere in 1862 with a clear injunction 
that he did not want a mere collection of rarities and curiosities, but an improving display of Indian and Eastern economic products to promote manufacturing, engineering and craft. Lockwood Kipling's mission in Lahore went beyond these economic and civilising agendas of the wider colonial regime. Though his views on India were a complex mix of colonial orthodoxy and independent observation, he passionately supported the preservation and promotion of traditional Indian crafts, suffering amid the effects of cheap British imports and Western art styles. He blamed, quotes, the march of civilization, the steam engine, with all of the material benefits which it had brought to India. Far more than export commodities, Indian arts were to be collected, valued and studied. And while William Morris and other proponents of the arts and crafts movement campaigned for lost tradition back in Britain, it was Lockwood Kipling's conviction that there was, quote, philosophical, historical and aesthetic grounds for the English in India to do all that lies in their power to foster her indigenous arts. He would deepen these beliefs when, in 1870, he was commissioned by the British government to tour India, sketching local craftsmen and women at work. As the authorities attempted both to understand artistic practices and, of course, to explore their commercial potential, Kipling's detailed drawings of embroiderers, potters, jewellers and cloth sellers were enthusiastically received by the European public, driven by a craze for Indian design. Since 1880, this cache of drawings has been housed at the V&A and it is a long way from the bull-headed, racialist and condescending vision of imperial superiority often associated with the writing and legacy of his son, Rudyard. Lockwood Kipling was determined to address the imbalance of traditional Indian crafts at the Lahore Museum, redirecting priorities from the regulatory and ethnographic concerns of the museum's previous custodians. By using the art museum and art school in tandem, Lockwood Kipling strove to restructure arts education at large, instead drawing on traditional practices in British India. Adopting the model of the South Kensington Museum, today's v &A, where Lockwood Kipling had begun his career as an architectural sculptor, in 1861, the Lahore Museum collection became the primary teaching tool for his students. His reports describe how designs, models, moulds and casts of work in the museum were built into the art school curriculum. Thanks to the strong ties built in his early career, the South Kensington Museum was among those offering donations, including a complete set of publications, etchings of objects, lithographs and catalogues, and electrotype examples of ancient goldsmiths' work. To ensure the original sculptures remained in Lahore, he encouraged the making of copies, photographs and plaster casts. South Kensington was just one beneficiary, receiving 73 casts of the Buddhist sculptures. Lockwood Kipling can be viewed as an enthusiastic and sincere champion of the arts whose impact on the Indian cultural landscape is undeniable. But while scholars previously argued that, in his appreciation of India's traditional arts, he opposed the imperialist view of Western cultural superiority, recent scholarship has suggested this instead reinforced colonial power hierarchies. As one journalist recently wrote, quote, even the most well-meaning denizen of British India are hard put to escape the taint of empire. If he is popularly remembered today, it is perhaps as the illustrator of his son's fiction. Rudyard Kipling's phenomenal popularity in his lifetime remains important. Between 1890 and 1910, Rudyard Kipling was one of the most widely read and talked about writers in the English-speaking world. Orwell even contended that, quotes, what Kipling wrote about 19th century Anglo-India 
is not only the best, but almost the only literary picture we have. Though Kipling lived only five years in British India, they were the most crucial in his development as a writer. India had been the paradise garden of his childhood, the land of lost delight, one biographer noted. India was Kipling's great subject, and he was instrumental in shaping British perceptions of the subcontinent in the late 19th and early 20th century. In fact, many learned only of empire through the novel exoticism and mystical adventure of Kipling's stories. Kipling was all too aware of this widespread national ignorance to British interests overseas. What do they know of England who only England know, he protested. Orwell, too, was quick to realise this political apathy, citing the famous insularity of the English. He called attention to the obliviousness of many ordinary Britons to empire's role in supporting their comfortable lifestyles back home. Given this vacuum of knowledge, Kipling's work is all the more significant to public consciousness. As Edward Said observed in his 1987 introduction to Kim, Kipling's literary role in the definition, the imagination, the formulation of what India was to the British Empire in its mature phase is extraordinarily important. Even in the briefest of passages, colonial influences are readily drawn. When Kim first encounters the Lama, he is, quotes, sat in defiance of orders, astride the gum Zamzamar on her brick platform. Who hold the Zamzamar, writes Kipling, that fire-breathing dragon holds the Punjab, for the great green bronze is always first of the conqueror's loot. And though Kim never expresses loyalty to, or even awareness of, the British Empire, the underlying permanence of British rule is fixed within the narrative. Where Kim does not speak directly, Kipling employs other characters to do so. At one stage, Kim and the Lama meet a veteran soldier who had served the government in the days of the mutiny. Of course, the mutiny he refers to is the Indian Rebellion of 1857. And it is revealing of Kipling's own sentiment that he utilises an Indian character who views his compatriots' actions as an act of madness that ate into all the army. As Said describes, we have left the world of history and entered the world of imperialist polemic. With its deliberate inclusions and exclusions, the truth of India and empire remains somewhat absent. In 1901, when Kim was published, India was the epicentre of the British Empire the greatest and most profitable of all the colonial possessions. For after some 300 years of white European control in the subcontinent, Said again explains how Kipling was writing from the perspective not just of a white man describing a colonial possession, but also of a massive colonial system whose economy, functioning and history had acquired the status almost of a fact of nature. As part of a generation that had grown up with empire, Kipling, like many others, supported its practices unthinkingly. But even so, toward the end of his life, Kipling was regarded by many as belonging to a now redundant age of empire. As Hugh Brogan wrote, Kipling reveled in history, used it for his own moral and political purposes, and brought it to life for his own time, for that very reason, his vision cannot carry conviction to a later age. His role as the propagandist for British colonial ventures engenders fresh criticism from each successive generation. Today, Kipling's colonial links have been called out afresh in the recent National Trust report, highlighting trust-owned properties with links to colonialism and slavery. Histories relating to the sources of wealth that paid for places and collections, the lives of staff and servants, the history of black presence at our places, and the wider context of British colonisation were occasionally mentioned, but were largely felt to be less relevant to typical country house visitors in the past. 
explained the National Trust as it outlined its pivot. Batemans, Kipling's former East Sussex home, was among those highlighted. For George Orwell, Rudyard Kipling and his work were heavily influential. Quotes, I worshipped him at 13, loathed him at 17, enjoyed him at 20, despised him at 25, and now again rather admire him. The one thing that was never possible, if one had read him at all, was to forget him. Given the popularity of the Just So stories and the Jungle Book, Kipling was, for many, the author of their childhood. This was certainly the case for Orwell, as with other influential literary figures, from W.H. Auden and T.S. Eliot to Hemingway and Tolkien. But despite Orwell's admiration for Kipling's literary talent, he condemned the imperialism to which he chose to lend his genius. Though George Orwell had begun his life much like Rudyard Kipling, he was transformed by his useful experiences as a policeman for the British Imperial Police Force in former Rangoon, colonised Burma. This was a time where he saw not the triumphant bugles or bejeweled maharajas, but the drunken sahibs pickled by heat and alcohol in mildewed clubs, the scarred and screaming Burmese in their prison cells. I had already made up my mind that imperialism was an evil thing, he wrote in his 1936 essay, Shooting an Elephant. And the sooner I chucked up my job and got out of it, the better. I hated it more bitterly than I can perhaps make clear. In a job like that, you see the dirty work of empire at close quarters. And it was these squalid and cruel encounters with the underbelly of empire that, quotes, oppressed him with an intolerable sense of guilt for his own part in the imperial system. For this was a system of latent despotism, he observed after leaving Burma in 1929, hiding behind the mask of democracy, because only the threat of force can subdue a population of several million subjects. If we are honest, he wrote, it is true that the British are robbing and pilfering Burma quite shamelessly. Only once those natural resources run dry, will the Burmese, quotes, appreciate how capitalism shows its gratitude to those to whom it owes its existence. And while Kipling had expounded the romantic legend of British heroism in the colonies, Orwell was plain spoken. He, Kipling, does not seem to realise, Orwell wrote, any more than the average soldier or colonial administrator that an empire is primarily a money-making concern. Tormented by this brutality and injustice, Orwell determined to confront myriad untold and uncomfortable truths with his pen. His colonial memoir, Burmese Days, published some years after returning to England, paints a wretched and shameful portrait of empire where all but a few characters, both colonizer and colonized alike, are grimly portrayed, all tainted by the colonial system they inhabit. I dare say it's unfair in some ways and inaccurate in some details, Orwell later suggested, but much of it is simply reporting what I have seen. But where does this history, where do these biographies leave the Victoria and Albert Museum? Our very title, connecting the collection to the first Empress of India. When the Victorian interest in Indian art in Britain surged, it found its nucleus at South Kensington. Just under two decades after Lockwood Kipling left London, South Kensington's Indian collections was enriched further by some 19,000 objects transferred from the East India Company collections originating from the Asiatic Society of Bengal, founded in 1784 by those employed in the East India Company. After seizing control in Bengal, the officials amassed vast collections of arts and antiquities, an effort first to understand and then as part of the psychology 
of colonialism. In 1798, East India Company officials, concerned that these collections were in danger of being neglected and at length in a great measure lost to Europe as well as to India, suggested a public repository back in London, constructed at the company's headquarters. Spoils from India were brought back to Britain as both a celebration of power and an attempt at intellectual ownership. After the transfer of India's government to the British Crown following 1857, the East India Company became defunct. Their collection became part of the new India office, and in 1879, a resolution transferred the India Museum to the South Kensington authorities. The highlight of the collection was undoubtedly the Man Tiger Organ. Sent back by the Governor General in 1800 after the storming of Sarangapatam and the bloody suppression of the Islamic ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan. Inside the tiger's flank is an organ whose sounds a contemporary description explained are intended to resemble the cries of a person in distress, intermixed with the horrid roar of the tiger. While the instrument was played, the hand of the European victim was lifted up and the head convulsively thrown back to express the agony of his helpless and deplorable situation. Tipu's tiger, as it was known, was found by British soldiers in the music room of Tipu Sultan's palace. And in 1808, the East India Repository in London recorded this as one of their most celebrated possessions. Unquestionably, Tipu's tiger was used as imperial propaganda. This characteristic memorial of the arrogance and barbarous cruelty of Tipu Sultan, as it was described in an accompanying pamphlet. Famous for his boast that he would rather live two days like a tiger than 200 years like a sheep, Tipu was widely known as the tiger of Mysore. By using the tiger to emphasise Tipu's sadism and his sheer otherness, the East India Company also obscured the many ways in which Tipu was actually surprisingly similar to Europeans. The vast majority of Sarangabatam objects attested to Tipu's aristocratic tastes and cultivations. As a museum born of this imperial moment, we are today working hard internally and externally to open up and discuss the V&A's colonial past. If the origins of the collection feel like they owe more to Kipling's Wonder House, then today our approach owes just as much to Orwell's clear-sighted account of the acquisitive often brutal reality of empire. On many university campuses and museum association bodies, there are calls to decolonize the curriculum or gallery. But for a museum like the V&A, so embedded with an imperial and colonial past, the notion of decolonization as a process of removing the colonial heritage makes little sense. What we can do is be transparent and scholarly about the nature of that history, the provenance of those objects, and interpret them as inclusively as possible for as many global audiences as possible today. This new agenda started with the Magdala 1868 display in 2018, exploring the 1868 battle at Magdala in Ethiopia. After the expedition to release British hostages being held by Emperor Chudos, the British army defeated the Emperor's forces, ransacked his fortress at Magdala before troops carted away looted treasure back to the UK. A number of these objects are now held across several British museums. This crown and chalice have been on display at the V&A for over 145 years, but the circumstances of their seizure and the consequences deserve to be much better known. So to mark the 150th anniversary of the siege and battle at Magdala, we open this free display of these important objects that span textiles, photography and metalwork. The display aimed more successfully to place these objects in context by focusing on the run-up to the battle and its controversial aftermath. Working closely with the Ethiopian Embassy, the local Ethiopian community and Orthodox Church, 
it was a timely opportunity to renew engagement with our Africa collections, to stimulate debate about Britain's imperial past and our shared cultural history, and to encourage a better and wiser understanding about these objects' past. We also made a clear statement that if the Ethiopian government was in, interested in pursuing a longer-term loan of the Magdala items, we stood ready to assist. But we also understood the difficult political circumstances that that involved. Just last year, we also opened a new display of Ashanti goldweights from Ghana, objects seized during the Third Anglo-Ashanti War of 1874. As V&A curator Angus Patterson explains, the gold was not taken simply for its financial value. By removing the regalia from the Ashanti court, Britain had stripped the Ashanti rulers of their symbols of government and denied them their authority to govern. Whilst historically, these items might have been presented primarily as a source of inspiration for design students and goldsmiths, we now explain their place within the ugly history of imperial trophy hunting, and inevitably how the South Kensington Museum was enveloped in such exercises of colonial violence. In time, we hope to share these items as well, far more equitably with museums and cultural institutions in modern Ghana. Deliberatively, scrupulously, beginning with the object and involving as many voices as possible, the role of the museum is to unleash more insight and more context into the discussion of this contested past. These displays are only the beginning of the process. At the same time, we're also taking vital steps to become more representative at the v &A, not just in our programming and galleries, but equally within the diversity of our staff. In the words of the arts educator Errol Francis, there is a connection between questions of what to do about colonial provenance, imperialist narratives of history and civilization, the lack of diversity of the workforce and the lack of interest from black, Asian and minority ethnic and working class audiences in what museums are doing. What Kipling and Orwell both believed in, for the Metropole at least, was the importance of the public sphere, the vital role of literature, journalism and debate. Today, amidst such factualism in our public life, the role of the museum, with its galleries born of exchange, adaptation and migration, is more important to civil discourse than ever. Whether it is the contribution of Mughal culture to Indian civilization, the debt of Chinese ceramics to Iranian influence, or other politically uncomfortable narratives, material culture contains the power to puncture the chauvinist myth. There is more need than ever for autonomous research focus and public-minded museums. Like Orwell outside the BBC, our role must be to provide a civic space in which all feel ownership that helps both to situate contemporary concerns within broader histories and also through the scholarly and challenging display of beauty and wonder help us move beyond the limitations of prescribed identities. But it must seek to do so with a frank understanding of the museum's own sometimes complicit history both its place within enlightenment or colonial practice with their implicit racial assumptions and the manner in which its collections were acquired and displayed. So just as a knowledge of Kipling helps us to understand Orwell, the reverse is also true. As Douglas Kerr explains, we can't really read Kipling's stories of the Raj in the same way once we've read Burmese days. Though Kipling's words are unchanged, the Orwell novel has changed how we read them. At the V&A too, we are changing, striving to unleash the widest possible context into the discussion of the contested past. It's only with this broad viewpoint, considering, even if not ascribing equal ethical value to, both ends of the Kipling-Orwell spectrum, that we can begin to comprehend empire and its place in the modern world. In our increasingly Orwellian post-truth culture, 
in which propaganda and disinformation threaten to reign unchecked, museums can still hope to play their role as trusted arbiters, disinterested distillers of history as they find it, or at the very least, honest guides to the present. In this pursuit of truth and scholarship, it is Orwell's integrity and fidelity to truth that rightly prevails over Kipling-esque propaganda, and his belief that liberty and freedom of thought requires a strong and vibrant civil society. But in this era of activist shaming and social media pylons, we also should not be afraid of respecting Kipling's literary work and his contribution to the canon. What is needed is the right to print what one believes to be true without having to fear bullying or blackmail from any side, Orwell once asserted. As we support Orwell's cardinal commitment to freedom of speech, we can, like him, also admire Kipling, the creative progenitor of the Wonder House, even as we seek to decolonize it. I'm sure there are going to be um, many questions um, in a little while uh, after our final two speaker films, and we look forward to that. Um, but before we get there, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our audience. We have almost 700 people with us this evening um, from all around the world, and it's a real pleasure to have you all with us um, at this Orwell Lecture. My name's Ken MacDonald, and I'm chair uh, of the Orwell Foundation. The foundation exists to celebrate and to sustain the legacy uh, of George Orwell and to promote what he described during his lifetime as his greatest ambition, that is to make political writing into an art. For Orwell, this was above all a moral project. Fundamentally, and without in any way being naive about the world, Orwell believed that public discourse, that political writing should be honest. For him, this was a point of first principle. And in his most startling work, Orwell showed that if leaders manage to persuade people that nothing is really true, or at least that it's impossible to distinguish between true and false facts, then just as those leaders intend, people lose their confidence in what is real, and the inevitable result is cruelty and human degradation. It's precisely to recognize and support work that best approaches Orwell's vision of moral political writing as the polar opposite of this process of destruction that the Orwell Foundation awards prizes each year for journalism, political fiction and nonfiction, and in association with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation for writing that best exposes contemporary social evils here in Britain. We also award the annual Orwell Youth Prizes for the best young people's writing. Now, before we turn to our next speakers, I'd like to thank the VNA for the producing the film of Tristan's lecture, UCL Special Collections, the home of the Orwell Archive for many of the images uh, that we used. And finally, to UCL itself for hosting us on their event software tonight, and indeed for hosting the Orwell Foundation in the Institute of Advanced Study at uh, UCL. Now we're going to turn to our next two speaker films. Tasneem Zakaria Mehta is an art historian, writer, curator, designer, and cultural activist. A leader of India's heritage preservation movement, she has successfully pioneered the revival and restoration of several of Mumbai's important cultural sites. As managing trustee and honorary director of the Dr. Baudaj Lad Mumbai City Museum, she conceptualized, curated, designed, and implemented, implemented that institution's restoration and revitalization. Dant Mian Wu is a Burmese historian, writer, and former United Nations, United Nations official and a conservationist. The author of four books, he's currently the chairman of Uthant House, a leading education and discussion center in Yangon, founder and chairman of the Yangon Heritage Trust, and a founding partner of the AVA Advisory Group. He's also an affiliated scholar of the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and once we've um, watched their two films, uh, Tristram may have one or two words more to say, um, and then we'll move directly to questions. Thank you very much.
I'm Tasneem Zakaria Mehta. I'm the director of the Dr. Bhagatilab Museum in Mumbai. I would like to start by congratulating Tristan Hunt for a wonderful lecture and also the Orwell Society for organizing such a great lecture. And though I agree with much of what Mr. Hunt has said, I would like to state that it is incumbent on institutions like the VNA to make a far more concerted effort to reach out to audiences not just in the UK, but also in India. I do not believe that this has happened as yet. It is important to honestly convey the controversial circumstances in which objects at the VNA and similar institutions were acquired, as Mr. Hunt has noted. But it is also as important to reach out to the many in India who will not have an opportunity to see these objects. It is important, therefore, to collaborate with Indian institutions and to bring these collections that were removed from their original sites to audiences in India and in the other parts of the world, but also to have an expansive view of such collaborations to foster a greater sense of shared community and equality. The need of the hour, as Mr. Hunt suggests, is the unbiased recognition and representation of various troubling histories. This requires the ability to bring in subaltern voices that may not necessarily agree with the narrative that even politically conscious museums like the VNA will present. For example, even though it is true that Lockwood Kipling was sympathetic to Indians and respected and admired traditional craftsmanship, his view of Indians was not unbiased or as honest as Orwell. He bought into the Raj's basic premises and assumptions. Like his compatriots, he harbored prejudices as to the ability of Indians to hold important positions and responsibilities. We know that he resisted, for example, the petition of, of Bhai Ram Singh, his most acclaimed and trusted assistant, who created Osborne House to become the principal of the Lahore School of Art after he had left. It was only later that Bhai Ram Singh succeeded to the post. Lockwood Kipling's interest in Gandharan art also stemmed from the colonial preference for such works as they showed a strong greco roman influence and therefore were eulogized as the acme of Indian art. At the Bhaudajilad Museum, the erstwhile Victorian Albert Museum in Bombay, and the oldest museum in Mumbai, we have addressed our colonial legacy by inviting Indian contemporary artists to interrogate our history and collection. This has been hugely successful effort. The whole museum is opened up to the artists to make interventions and to respond to the objects. The program was a deliberate political riposte to the fact that Indian artists were excluded from the museum's ambit during the colonial period, as they were not considered capable of the intellectual refinement required for the fine arts. In a book that we are bringing out on our collection, we have been objective about the intentions and purposes with which the collection was built, which is nonetheless significant and includes exquisite examples of craftsmanship very similar to those held at the VNA. I grew up, as did my children, loving the just so stories and the adventures of Mowgli in the Jungle Book. I studied Animal Farm in 1984 at school. And Lockwood Kipling's drawings in the museum's holdings are an important legacy. Even though I am aware of the circumstances of the production of these artworks, it does not diminish the joy of their experience. I believe it is important to understand that the truth most often is nuanced.
But as Mr. Hunt notes, it is important to grapple with the truth and in deference to Orwell, we must be fearless about telling that truth, especially as institutions that interpret histories and artworks in the hope that it will help us build a more equitable and just world. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me this evening. I'm very pleased to be with you and honored by this opportunity uh, to give some remarks after Tristan Hunt's extremely timely, thoughtful and stimulating lecture. I live in Burma and Kipling and Orwell both have a special place in Burmese history. Kipling, who was in Burma for all of a day, framed much English language thinking about the country as a province of India, but unlike any other place in India, romanticizing Burma and setting it apart, not just from India, but from the rest of the world, and fueling a mythology of Burmese exceptionalism, almost always unhelpful, that we often see to this very day. And Orwell, who lived in Burma for many years and about whom some Burmese like to joke, wrote not just one novel about Burma, but a trilogy, Burmese Days, 1984, and Animal Farm, who saw colonialism as a money-making racket at its very core and also understood the new nationalisms emerging from colonialism as potentially deeply problematic. I couldn't agree more with Tristram on the need to remake our museum, something that's happened under his leadership at the VNA, and on the many ideas on this going forward that he's presented here tonight. I'd just like to make a couple of comments and then a suggestion. The first is that honest and open discussions about empire, colonial legacies, race and identity are urgent not only in the UK. Modern Burma, for example, over the 19th century was created as a racial hierarchy. And though the racial and ethnic categories developed under colonialism had local antecedents, the categories we now have are very much products of the British Empire, and in particular, the imperial censuses of the early 20th century. And Burma is a country where this has not been a happy legacy, where we've had seven decades of armed, often identity-based conflicts, as well as race-based nationalism and extreme violence. It's a country where very few have any sense of the history of these identities and the ways in which they link to past imperial projects. I know in Burma that colonialism is taught simply as a disastrous interregnum before and after which is a timeless nation comprised of races, some indigenous and others alien. And the absence of informed debate on colonialism feeds directly into an exclusionary and often violent ethnic-based nationalism. Second, going back to Orwell's observation that money-making was at the heart of empire in Burma, is that the political economy of empire should be central to discussions of colonialism. Though the idea that colonialism was a system of ex economic exploitation is nothing new, I wonder the extent to which ordinary people in any country appreciate the ways in which this exploitation has created the world that's still all around us. Few in Burma know the colonial origins of Burma's poverty and underdevelopment. And though there are certainly many Burmese who shoulder much of the blame for Burma's myriad problems since independence, it is this ignorance of the colonial past which makes the country, I believe, much less able to imagine alternative futures, as well as much more vulnerable to new incarnations of colonialism and new forms of external exploitation. And finally, I make these points to suggest that the challenges Tristram Hunt has outlined so well, including ways in which to exit Kipling's Wonder House and create decolonized museums are not just English challenges or UK challenges, but challenges for all of us. It's vital, I think, that we have a network, not just of museums and other institutions, but individuals as well, using new as well as old media to start fresh discussions that look at the past, but with a firm eye to the future. As we come out of this pandemic and into a world that's already in a climate emergency, where all existing systems and ideologies, political and economic, may fray and need to be reimagined, we will need more than ever to think anew about the past and have a discussion that should be a shared discussion, a conversation, especially, but perhaps not exclusively, across the former empire. The subjects are incredibly thorny ones. The debates will be incredibly controversial. But in the end, it's a shared discussion that will be infinitely more difficult, but always more productive and infinitely more interesting as well. Thank you very much.
Tristram, do you have any comments on, on what we've just heard? Well, I'm very grateful um, to Hasneem and to them for um, their, their reflections um, this evening. Um, I think Tasneem's put about richer, deep collaboration between institutions in the UK and India to explore these, these histories and actually institutions in Myanmar today um, is profoundly important. And um, museums are like of newspapers, we, we, we like events and deadlines. Obviously, 2022 is the 70th anniversary of, uh, of independence in, in India. And, and that might be a moment for us to think really collaboratively about future partnerships. And, and share and within that as, as Tasney uh, says to ensure that different voices um, not just worlds of kind of Lockwood and Rudyard Kipling heard uh, seems to be um, endlessly important and then I think with with that's reflections um, that um, we're beginning now in the UK to understand in in some ways the the economic um, legacies of empire in terms of the 18th century and the money that flowed through that scholars have known about um, how important uh, empire was to the early stages of the industrial revolution for a very long time but it seems to me recently with the work of the national trust and elsewhere this is entering public discourse in a, in a, in a much more uh, effective manner but i think that's point that this also has to be reflected in former uh, colonial settings that the economic costs of underdevelopment, the economic cost of enrichment through empire and, and the long legacies of that um, also needs to be appreciated in terms of the political economy um, of um, empire. Um, and then to think about how we take those conversations forward um, and uh, to make sure, and there was some conversation in the chat we can come back to, that this history is understood and explored at, at, a, at a much deeper level, because it has political conferences today, and that, that point of understanding the past gives you the options for a different political future, rather than limiting your horizons about potential political futures, seem to be enormously important, and, and that's what I think Orwell would probably want us to take from this conversation. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. So look, we're going to move um, directly to questions now, and we've got about 25 minutes or so for those. We're going to start with a question from one of our youth fellows, if you don't mind, Tristram. Um, just as each year our adult prize winners and runners-up become fellows of the Orwell Foundation, so too do our youth prize winners and uh, runners-up, and our 2020 youth fellows, all brilliant young writers and thinkers, have been discussing issues relating to the lecture theme uh, this year, and they've nominated one of their number uh, to ask our opening question, and, and, and that is Rosaline Tite Ahern. So if Rosaline is with us, would you like to ask uh, your question, Rosaline, and, and welcome. Thank you. Um, so our question that we've decided on is, in the telling of many important but harrowing colonial stories, how do you suggest museums avoid becoming sad, distressing places to visit and preserve a sense of wonder and enjoyment? I, th I think that's a fascinating question. Thank you. Um, and um, Dan Hicks, who's one of the curators at the, at the Pitt Rivers uh, Museums, has spoken eloquently on, on this point of how the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford can be seen as this site of colonial violence um, and some of the, the kind of responses to that. Um, and we as a museum of, of art, design and performance, do not have within our collection some of the more kind of egregious artifacts of empire. Um, and one thinks most obviously of the shackles um, and the metal uh, connected to the history uh, of enslaved Africans. Um, and we've always thought carefully about how, how, how we would display um, any such items. So I think this is up to the skill of the curators that, that you can, um, use your display of artifacts to tell a uh, as credible and truthful uh, and powerful story as possible which also um, is you know rewarding and enriching uh, but falls shy of that line of kind of shock and terror um, Alternatively, other museums, and you think most notably of the Holocaust Museum um, in 
in, in Washington, DC, and then other hot horse museums around the world, consciously seek to develop that oceanal response to uh, you know, the, the mounds of shoes taken uh, from uh, the, the, the victims of the Holocaust as a way actually to promote that, 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 that kind of sense of revulsion and that sense of, uh, of horror. So there, there's a place for it in the world of museums, uh, but um, not, for example, um, at the V&A. That said, finally, we really we, we had a new gallery in, 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 our, in our British galleries thinking about richness and humour. And within that, we had sketches from Goodness Gracious Me, we had uh, sketches from Monty Python, um, and we consciously had on display some of the sketches with highly racialized uh, language and put trigger warnings in the sense there that what was on display was, um, you know, could be offensive to some people. So you can also, in a sense, find a, what we used to call a third way, uh, to manage this, that, that you, you have on display some of those uh, the, those artifacts or, or that language, but also warn people that that's what they will experience. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Purnima Wirasakara, who's a journalist from Sri Lanka. Actually, there are two questions. The first is, how can museums be reimagined or redesigned as sites of conscience to understand, remember, or even deal with the legacies of empire racism and to act as a buffer against the rise in far-right politics in the UK? What can be done in addition to relabeling items with a few extra lines on their colonial um, origin? Well, I think on relabeling, we, we can do a lot um, and, and, and we're doing more. Um, and there, in, for example, to continue the, the, the previous order, within our collections, there are items with highly racist labeling uh, because these were, in a sense, artifacts of racism, notably, uh, music hall scripts from the 1920s and 1930s, which again we highlight uh, in terms of the racist language connected um, to them. But here, become, here comes a really interesting balance in terms of the, the leadership and management of, of museums. So primarily the Victoria and Albert Museum is a museum of art, design and performance, living the story of fine and decorative arts, telling the story of theatre performance, a place of sculpture, ceramics, glass, art of photography. Within that are items collected within colonial contexts and connected to history of colonialism. And so what do you stress more? Do you stress the history of design? Do you stress uh, the artistic lineage? Do you stress the story of making? Or do you stress the provenance, the, the colonial histories, but, but potentially some, some of the fun connected to the history uh, of slavery. And at the moment, there's much more interest um, in provenance questions, in histories of ownership, in global histories. And so we're adjusting to that because we're here to serve the public. But we also should lose sight of our mission, which is to inspire designers and artists and creative practitioners with some of the greatest ones uh, of human creativity in the world. So in a sense, our mission is not to be a site of conscience. Our mission is to show 5,000 years of human ingenuity and imagination. But within that, we have collections connected to colonialism, which I think we should be much more explicit and transparent and open about. And it's managing that balance at the moment, which is why we're open to this conversation, but we're also to challenge and contestation. Okay, well then, in, in the light of that, here's a very direct question from um, a volunteer guide at the VNA who asked you, this is Deborah Charkham, how do I answer the question of restitution when I'm showing and describing our objects? The answer to restitution is that the VNA is not allowed by terms of its foundation in 1983 to what's called decession, to remove any items from the uh, collection. And so what we're trying to do at the moment is work really hard with uh, nations uh, and government who, who are seeking the repatriation, restitution of items. And actually, there are very few cases there about two or three cases. And the most important one is our Ethiopian collection, our Dala collection taken in 1888. Um, and 
we are involved in a conversation with the Ethiopian embassy and the Ethiopian government and Dias communities in London um, about how we can get these items uh, to Addis, how we can get these items to Ethiopia within the legal constraints we operate under. And at the moment, our best way to seek to achieve that is on through a system of long-term loans. But quite quietly and quite understandably, the communities to whom we're seeking to lend these items say, hold on, you're asking us to borrow items from you that you took from us. And at the moment, legally, uh, that's all we can do. Uh, and so that's the answer on restitution at the moment. But the longer term conversation is how do we build up rich and fruitful partnerships between ourselves, South Asia, as Tasnim uh, uh, pointed to, Ethiopia, which benefit understanding through museums. And museums are places where people should understand the world through material objects. How we can share that knowledge, that understanding both ways much more effectively. Jeet Baines says that in, in your lecture, you've demonstrated the ways in which knowledge must insert, must insert itself into present day controversies. And he goes on to ask whether you agree that museums like the BNA have an important role to play in ensuring that government education policy is changed so that all aspects of colonial history are taught in schools. And we had a number of comments in the chat function during your lecture pointing out that colonial history is not really taught in UK schools, or at least not many aspects of it, and perhaps not the most important aspects of it. So what's the role of museums uh, in this process of education? Well, I, th I think museums are enormously important in this. And my view is we, we almost put too much responsibility onto schools. I think schools should do everything. Um, and actually, um, historically, it was families, it was church chapels, it was trade unions, it was mechanics institutes, it was all sorts of areas of learning as well as schools. So I think museums should be, should be part of that um, and uh, both regionally and nationally, museums in Britain are world leaders in terms of education provision uh, and in terms of engaging uh, with schools um, and young people. So we have responsibility to do more. We, we should do that both in terms of the teaching of, of colonial history and, and world history, but then also for the VNA, we're very much about teaching design and technology and ensuring young people have, have a much richer and fulfilling design education. Within the history syllabus today, uh, there is um, really good um, curriculum material on empire um, in key stage three. Um, in terms of the Mughal past and the advent of the British Empire in South Asia, in terms of the Atlantic trade in slaves uh, and the development uh, of the 18th century triangular trade. Material is there if you look. The challenge is that under you know, most secondary state schooling, it's one hour of history a week, and then young people can drop it at the age of 14. Um, so I don't think the curriculum is the problem. I think there's more than enough there to tell a really interesting story uh, of Britain in the world and the world in Britain. But the challenge is to get head teachers and deputy head teachers under huge pressure to get the maths and English right, to get the baccalaureate right, um, to, to put pressure on them to say, give history its space within the curriculum. Uh, and Ken, this is something you and your colleagues in Oxford by thinking about just as much as us. Well, yeah, we are. And there's a lot of discussion about it, obviously. Um, it's, it's hugely topical. Sonia Baskar writes, um, in India, we see a rise in right-wing Hindu nationalism, an effort made to revise the school curriculum to erase mention, for example, of Tipu Sultan and in other ways. What's going to be the impact of distorted views of history that are being propagated as part of the current political agenda on the future generation, given that even museums are not being spared from this sort of reinterpretation? I think it's profoundly important that museums remain independent, autonomous parts of civil society. Um, and uh, we're very grateful for the funding at the VNA, but we're an arm's length body. Um, and, you know, uh, governments can go and education ministers can, and go, 
uh, but important parts of cultural and educational life of nations, like the museums um, in India, Pakistan, uh, or here, here in the UK, have this broader role and mission. So we should seek as much as possible not to be influenced by uh, the political agendas of the day, whilst also understanding that we are paid for by the taxpayer. Uh, and, and how we uh, make the case is that it is in the long-term interest of the taxpayer that we do not re re you know, respond to every political change is, is part of the kind of challenge of, of leadership. But it's also important that, that collections um, again, remain beyond political whim. And, and to go to this complex point about deaccessing, about getting rid of items from museums, you know, one generation will look very poorly on, on a certain part of the past, another generation will admire it. And the merit of, uh, of universal museums, encyclopedic museums with great collections stretching back thousands of years, is that what is unfashionable today be very important uh, later, we've just acquired a large piece um, of Robin Hood Garden, a brutalist 1960s uh, housing estate in Poplar uh, in London, because we think that's important for architectural studies long into the future, even though we were condemned at the time for acquiring it. So it's it, it, it giving your support, I think, to the autonomy of museums as cultural institutions, which is important. Yeah, I'm sure you were right to acquire it, incidentally. <laughs> I'm sure that was the right thing to do. Michael Collins says, towards the end of your lecture, you suggested the idea of, quote, decolonizing museum in terms of removing objects and so on doesn't make sense. He says, with respect to the more specifically epistemological dimensions of the decolonizing agenda, challenging the museum as a product of colonial and racist forms of knowledge, is there another term you prefer which could usefully replace decolonizing? And, and if there is, why would you prefer that term. Is there something about the term you don't like? I'm not, I'm not sure whether there is. I mean, my argument is that with a museum, and, and it might be around language, and, it might, it, it, and, 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 and finding the right language for this might, might, might be a way through. But it seems to me that for a museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, to decolonize it um, is almost an, an illogicality because the colonial is so embedded uh, within the history of the collections, within the fabric um, of the building. And to suggest that it could all be stripped away, it could be decolonialized uh, in terms of the history and the collections, um, seems to me the wrong way of framing it. And I'm open to, to new and different framings. But that doesn't preclude what we should all be doing, which is being rigorous and scholarly and transparent about the colonial past and as Orwell taught us about the nature of much of that colonial uh, past. Um, and at the same time, making this museum with its depictions of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of different colonial legacy as open uh, and accessible to a, a wider range of people as possible today. So I, this is what I saw with that. I, I, I in, in many ways, I'm hugely sympathetic to the, the decolonized agenda as a way of opening a past and placing the colonial within it. Indeed, I've you know, written a, a book about, a book about why that's important. But I think there's a, there's a problematic connected to it with an institution like the VNA or indeed the, the British Museum and others. I would also, to put all my cards on the table, I think some of the politics of some of the decolonized now movements go into areas where I would also be um, uh, skeptical about joining them in terms of some of the politics that, you know, museums I'm paid for here by taxpayers right across the country who are neither radical left nor radical right, who aren't that necessarily interested in some of the sort of cultural wars being whipped up. So when, when some of the decolonized movements move into more political agendas, I think I have to be careful as a steward of a national institution paid for by taxpayers across the country. But being more honest about the artefacts, certainly. Oh, abso absolutely. But and in a sense, it's, it's, it's what's changed with the times. In, in the past, 
curators wouldn't necessarily have been dishonest about it, mm. but the audience whom they were serving were not necessarily interested in the same manner as quite rightly we are today. Well, Madeline Hoban's got an interesting question. Um, how does the VNA use architectural tools such as spatial arrangements and or lighting sensitively to guide the visitors gaze through objects with a colonial history? That's a really interesting question. And, and it, in a sense, you um, are, in a sense, I think he probably hasn't got that far because we, we mainly use our lighting tools for, for very, very particular conservation purposes. Um, so ensuring, for example, that filigree work on the Magdala a crown in Ethiopia um, is preserved for as long as possible um, in as good a condition as possible is our primary objective. So we either, we don't, as it were, seek to kind of exoticize or to put into the dark um, any of these collections. I think the, the absolute primary objective is, is conservation um, and, and the obligation to to ensure that few generations in, in whatever form have access to see these, these, these works of material wonder for themselves. Yeah. Phoebe asks, um, as, as a director of a museum, does the backlash against the National Trust colonial report worry you? Is there a big risk um, around alienating political demographics and funding because of current culture wars? I think we have to be alert um, to this um, debate um, and um, I think as I say I, th I, th I think the, the work the National Trust have done about you know thinking um, uh, about you know um, Keston outside Derby Kern's uh, seat and its connection um, to Curzon's history in in South Asia makes total sense. Um, uh, thinking uh, about how some of the um, Atlantic um, trade uh, funded the, the profits of numerous families who, who, who then built, you know, uh, houses. I mean, they, they, you know, they, they were saying in the 18th century about uh, money coming from the West Indies and the Nabobs coming south. You know, this is this is not a new um, uh, argument in a sense, but putting it in the public sphere much more effectively. Um, is um, and I think that's only you know that's only right and proper. But I think, as as I said, I think we have to be careful about not being seen to preclude certain points of view. And 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 that's my point in the lecture that Orwell, in a sense, wanted Kipling to be read. Um, he, he he disagreed with Kipling's vision of empire. He disagreed. Uh, with racism, he disagreed uh, with the kind of, you know, British bullishness of, of, of much of it and, and those associated with Kipling. But he understood his place in the canon and understood his place within history. So it's an understanding both in a sense of that, that, that kind of negative colonial history, but also understanding that someone like Kipling also plays a role in the story of Britain and the story of British history. And however difficult we might find that today, we also have to have space to understand it. Yeah, Joe Hertley um, says, I think it's important to place museums in a longer common line rather than this current trend to see Western museums as merely elitist. Is not your focus on heritage to accommodate today's current preoccupations, seeking to undermine a much more significant cultural gain to seek common humanity through comparison to a narrower particular that is only emphasizing difference. I mean, I, I, I think that is the enlightenment vision of what uh, museums are about. That's absolutely right. That, you know, the, the joy of coming across collections from um, Ethiopia, from Southern England, uh, from Northern Spain, um, from the Americas, and thinking about the interplay uh, of aesthetics and culture and design through that is exactly right. The, the history of this museum, in contrast to the kind of enlightenment history uh, of the British Museum, is that we were part of that mid 19th century moment of trying to, what was described as educate our future masters, of create educated citizenry through showing 
the history of Ottoman design and technology and manufacturing. And so whether it's the BNA or the Pottery Museum and Art Gallery Stoke or the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery uh, or the Nottingham Castle Museum, these great Midlands and London museums, which were known as the People's Galleries and this idea of a democratic right to thinking about culture and art and design is, is our niche. And it's really important that we absolutely hold on to that. And that means being as accessible and open and interesting um, as possible. So I think you're, you're right that there are multiple histories that, that, that we can draw upon. And I'm always inspired, maybe because I was a Victorian historian, about that kind of mid-19th century moment of democratic access to culture. Yeah. Adam Balin um, mentions Edward Said and wants to know whether you subscribe to his view that Westerners during the age of colonialism were Orientalists and by definition racist. I, I, I think Said's work is, is, is profound and there's no doubt that the kind of um, the the construction of the Orient and the exoticization of the Orient and all of the, to get Dan's point about all of the political consequences of that were profound. Um, but I'd say two things. I'd say one, Said also often spoke about empire, and particularly seized within empire, as places of great creativity and fertility and places of exchange and migration. And when we talk about material culture, Often it would come from those great cities of empire, not necessarily the British Empire, but some of the great global empires of the past. And what's also so interesting, I think there's a sale at Pudis this week or, or next week, how interesting at the moment that Gulf states and Gulf um, collectors are buying up as a classic you know, 19th century Orientalist art, that actually this depiction of the Orient uh, from from the early 1800s is now uh, an item of incredible value uh, to Gulf collectors, those in uh, the, the contemporary Middle East. And I don't know what that means, but I think it's interesting. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we've only got time for one more question. And since this is the Orwell um, lecture, I'm I'm going to select this one. It's from Deborah Tavares, and she says, "What are the possibilities that Orwell's work?" now coming out of con uh, copyright, what are the possibilities that it can help and inspire the general public when it comes to deepening knowledge regarding the processes of ex exploitation and, and no doubt she has in mind their um, colonialism? And what's, so, the role, what's the role that Orwell can play in this? I, 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 think, I think Orwell plays a profound role in his understanding of history um, and, and, and history of British colonialism. I think he plays a role in, at the same time, his understanding of England and his understanding of, of Britain. But of all, he, he plays the role of, of the ability to explain politics and political motives and political context with, you know, that, that total grasp and clarity uh, that, 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 that he always gave. So um, it's, you know, that there, there, there is always more to learn from George Orwell. That's certainly true. Tristan, thank you so much um, for your lecture um, and for answering all these questions. And thank you so much also to Tasneem uh, Zakaria Mehta and to Bant uh, Meantu for your contributions. Um, thank you to the audience uh, for your questions. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Orwell Foundation for organizing uh, this um, lecture, by which I don't mean me, I mean Gene Seaton, the director, um, and in the office, Jeremy Whiteley, uh, Alex Talbot uh, and Jordan Dilworth. Thank you all so much for, for what you've done. I'd also like to thank Sarah Gibbs, a DPhil candidate at UCL, who's been working with our Orwell Youth Fellows um, uh, and has helped to organise workshops for them. Um, we're going to end um, appropriately with a few words, a few final words from George Orwell's son, who was very generously uh, sponsored uh, this lecture, Richard Blair. And incidentally, before we move to Richard, can I also thank very, very sincerely those members of the audience who have made contributions and donations to the Orwell Foundation. Those donations are hugely appreciated. Thank you all very much indeed. Richard, over to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, Tristan, I have to uh, congratulate you on an extremely interesting 
uh, presentation tonight. I'm, uh, I was quite interesting to hear what the, the museums, especially the VNA, are going to be trying to do for the future. And that is to try and explain the origins of the, the exhibits, because we have this situation in, in the moment of a lot of people kicking up a lot of fuss um, because they don't want to know what happened in the past. And I think you're going to have your, your work cut out. Um, it's going to take a long time, probably almost as long as it's going to take us to get rid of COVID-19. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how you, how you well, you did uh, mention how you're going to approach it, but it'll be interesting to see the end result and whether there will be people who will still complain at, uh, uh, about what they're, they're seeing uh, because they are programmed to complain. Uh, unfortunately, there are many people who are like that, both old and, uh, and young. So um, yes, I guess it's, a, it's a, a something that's gonna take you several years to get around to doing. I, I have no idea how long it will take you, um, but that you might know, I certainly wouldn't. So I would just like to say thank you very much indeed. That was a wonderful lecture. And I noticed that we had, uh, we were up to about seven, nearly 700 participants. Now I have a feeling that uh, if this had been a, a live lecture in, in a lecture hall, I'm not quite sure we would have got so many people in. So in spite of the circumstances of the year, Zoom really has done quite a lot for us, bless it. So thank you very much indeed for, for your, your uh, contribution.